Warning. This podcast may prove to be damaging to the comfort of closely held presuppositions. Remember to practice Acts 17.11 and examine the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. James 1.27 Shalom, Alachim, peace be upon you. Welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean, your host. Website is www.scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to support this mission of truth. That's also where you go to find the archives and uh, sign up for the beginner's course for biblical Hebrew. All those things can be found at the website, scriptureandprophecy.com. Well, I hope you're all doing well. I don't know about you, but... It seems like winter has just been relent- relentless this year. Um, just snow after snow after snow, freezing after freezing after freezing. And I am one of those people that enjoys the changing of the seasons uh, because it reminds me. You know, when spring gets here, it just kind of it reminds me of my uh, of our walk with God in a way. You know. Um, you and the peaks and valleys that you have in your life, you know, winter comes and it's cold and it seems like it's never going to end. But then before you know it, it starts to fall and you start to hear birds chirp and you start to feel the warm sun on your skin. And so I, I love that aspect, but, uh, there's times when it seems like the winter's going on so long that it does start to impact me (laughs) on it on like at a emotional level, I guess, seasonal stuff, I guess. And uh, it's just seemed relentless this year, and we've gotten quite a bit of snow uh, this year where I live. Interestingly enough, uh, there's some Hebrew, old ancient Hebrew beliefs, if you will, that suggest that the that snow is a sign of God's grace and mercy. And so maybe if you're looking outside today and you just see everything just covered, you know, you think of that passage in Isaiah, right? Though your sins be like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. And there's nothing whiter than a just a a fresh, you wake up in the morning and it's, it's snowed all night. Everything is covered. It's that idea that that's, that's how your sins will be. So they'd be like Scott, they'd be white as snow. So the next time you see it, think to yourself, a sign of God's grace and God's mercy. Well, we are looking at our prophets portion for this week, and it's actually really, really short this week. Uh, it's first Kings chapter five, eighteen through verse or chapter six, verse thirteen. Very, very, very short. It has to do with the building of Solomon's temple. And so that is what is on the Torah or the prophet's portion schedule. Uh, but then we're going to look at Revelation 11 and Zechariah chapter 4 too. Uh, so don't worry, it won't be a five-minute podcast. With that said, let's go ahead and get the prophet's portion read for this morning. And then we're going to look at Revelation 11 and probably raise more questions than we're going to answer. All right, let's begin. And Solomon's builders and Haram's builders did hew them and the stone corers so that they prepared timber and stone to build the house. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were out of Egypt, where the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel and the month Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. 
In the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, the length thereof was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof twenty cubits, and the height thereof thirty cubits. In the porch before the temple of the house, twenty cubits was the length thereof, according to the breadth of the house, and ten cubits was the breadth thereof before the house. And for the house he made windows of narrow lights. And against the wall of the house he built chambers round about, against the walls of the house round about, both of the temple and of the oracle, and he made chambers round about. The nevermost chamber was five cubits broad, and the middle was six cubits broad, and the third was seven cubits broad. For without the wall of the house he made narrow rest round about, that the beams should not be fastened in the walls of the house. And the house was in the building. And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. The door for the middle chamber was in the right side of the house, and they went up with winding stairs into the middle chamber and out of the middle into the third. So he built the house and finished it, and covered the house with beams and boards of cedar. And then he built chambers against all the house, five cubits high, and they rested on the house with timber of cedar. And the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this house which thou art building, if thou wilt walk in my statutes, and execute my judgments, and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then I will perform, perform my word with thee, which I spoke unto David thy father. And I will dwell among the children of Israel, and will not forsake my people Israel. And that is the end of the portion. Solomon building this house for the Lord. I really like that last two verses where God comes to Solomon and says, Concerning this house which you're building, if you will walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep my commandments and walk in them, then I will perform, perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father, and I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will not forsake my people Israel. Of course, it's just one of seemingly endless scriptures where God says, if you do this, then I will do this. He says, if you will walk in my statutes and execute my judgments, and keep my commandments. Then, I'll do my part. Right? I'll do the thing I said I was going to do to your father David, and I will dwell among you. And I will not forsake you. Let's move on to Revelation 11. And uh, if you're curious, you know, the portion is simply just what we read. And in the tradition that's been going on for thousands of years, we would just read that portion. Uh, but for the sake of the podcast not being five minutes long, I try to add in things that I think are relevant and interesting and also prophetic. And so we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 11 today. King James Bible, let's go ahead and take a look. I'll be stopping and talking and looking at some commentary and maybe looking at some verses from Zechariah chapter 4 along the way. So let's look. Verse 1. And it was given me a reed, like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, that they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God, before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must be in this manner be killed. These have the power to shut heaven that it rain not in the forty days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. 
And when they shall finish their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Let's just stop right there about halfway through our chapter. We have the two witnesses. And there's a lot of beliefs, especially in recent memory, in the last 20 to 30 years, uh, floating around about what these two witnesses are or who these two witnesses are. Now, one of the most common beliefs is that it's it's either Elijah and Enoch or Elijah and Moses. And I think that's entirely possible. I also think it's entirely possible that it's not talking about two individual people, that the two witnesses represent potentially the Jewish church and the Gentile church. Uh, my point in bringing that up is that you should keep your mind and heart and eyes open for these possibilities. The problem is, is when we get married to certain pet doctrines, then we're unable to see other possibilities and they could come upon you and you not recognize them because you're holding to what you believe it's going to look like. We see the perfect examples of when Jesus came for the first time. No one was expecting him to go to a, to go and die for the sins. Even though the prophecies do describe that. They thought for sure he was going to defeat the Romans and set up the kingdom literally on earth at that moment. And that's not how it played out. That's not to say that it won't eventually play out that way, right? But that's not how it played out at that time. So do not think that you have this all figured out. The scriptures say if a man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet that he ought to know. Be humble. A couple things to notice about these two witnesses. Number one, they're clothed in sackcloth picture of humility these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks he says standing before the god of the earth interestingly enough Zacharias sees these two olive trees these olive trees and candlesticks uh, but unfortunately he does not plainly tell us the angel who's talking to Zachariah does, still does not plainly tell us who they are there's a reason for this God has concealed it you'll know it when you see it Let's just read from uh, Zechariah chapter 4, 14 verses. This is that story where this comes from. He says, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me, as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick of all gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and seven lamps therein, and the seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. Sounds like he's seeing the, the menorah, right? And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and I speak to the angel and he talked with me saying, What are these, my lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my lord. Then he answered and he spake unto me saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Sabaoth. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zer of Abel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zer of Abel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of the small things? For they shall rejoice, they shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then I answered and I said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left thereof? And I answered again, and he said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which though the golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered, and he said to me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my lord. And then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. 
And that is the end of that. That's Zechariah 4. Again, doesn't really answer the question plainly, does it? If I might, I want to read just a little bit of commentary from Matthew Henry on uh, these two witnesses, and then we'll finish the reading. He says this, Some think these two witnesses are Enoch and Elijah, who are to return to the earth for a time. Others, the church of the believing Jews and that of the Gentiles. It should rather seem that they are God's eminent faithful ministers, who shall not only continue to profess the Christian religion, but to preach it in the worst times. The time of the prophesying, or bearing their testimony for Christ, a thousand two hundred and threescore days, that is, as many think, to the period of the reign of the Antichrist. And if the beginning of that interval could be ascertained, this number of prophetic days, taking a day for a year, would give us a prospect of when the end shall be. Their habit, their posture, they prophesy in sackcloth of those who are deeply affected with the low and distressed state of the churches and the interest of Christ in the world. How they are supported and supplied during this discharge of their great and hard work, they stood before the God of the whole earth, and he gave them power to prophesy. He made them to be like Zerubbabel, who we just read about, right? And Joshua, the two olive trees and the candlestick in the vision of Zechariah. So, uh, Matthew Henry, and we've talked about this on the podcast maybe six months ago where we studied this, uh, that in this instance, it's Zerubbabel in, in Zechariah, it's Zerubbabel and Joshua who are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. So in this scenario, it is two individual people, which means it could be two individual people uh, that the Revelation is talking about, or it could be representation of many people. Continuing with Matthew Henry's commentary on this, he says, God gave them the oil of the holy zeal and courage and strength and comfort, and he made them olive trees, and their lamps of profession were kept burning by the oil of inward gracious principles, which they received from God. They had oil not in their lamps, but in their vessels, habits of spiritual life, light, and zeal. I also have to agree with Matthew Henry here that oil represents that spiritual life, that light. When you think about the ten maidens, five of them had oil in their lamp and five of them didn't. I think it's a representation of that spiritual life, the light and the zeal as Matthew Henry puts it. He continues and says, Their security and defense during the time of the prophesying, if any attempt to hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours them. Some think this alludes to Elijah's calling for fire from heaven to consume the captains in their companies that came to seize him in 2 Kings chapter 1. God promised the, the prophet Jeremiah, Behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people shall be wood, and it shall devour them. So Matthew Henry's making the point, and see, this is what I like about his commentary, is he's like me, although he's way more advanced, but he thinks in the same manner as in to think, hey, there's multiple possibilities here. We should keep our eyes, our hearts, and our minds open for these possibilities. So he's saying the fire could be literal, like it was for Elijah, or it could be a spiritual thing, like it was for Jeremiah, where he said, behold, I will make the words in your mouth fire, and this people will be wood, and it shall devour them, you know, by their praying and their preaching. And so anyway, just some things for you to chew on and to think on. Let's go ahead and finish this story about the two witnesses, and we'll wrap up the podcast for this morning. Starting with verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their body shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. Now, almost always, when the Bible talks about the great city, it's talking about Jerusalem. And in this case, it makes it clear that it's talking about Jerusalem, but notice that it refers to Jerusalem in the last days as spiritually Sodom and spiritually Egypt. 
and then it clarifies that it is Jerusalem by saying where our Lord was crucified. That great city, which is called Sodom and Egypt, which is what they become, where the Lord was crucified, that's where this is happening at. Their bodies will lie in the streets. Verse 9, And they of the people and kindreds of tongues and nations shall see their bodies three days and a half, and not suffer their bodies to be put in graves. So for three and a half days, their bodies are just going to lay in the streets. Verse 10, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts to one another. Kind of like how the how the world celebrates Christmas, right? Ooh, yay, the, these annoying prophets are gone, who shut up the heavens, right? Who did, who, who kept preaching that we needed to repent, and they send gifts to one another. It says, and they dwell upon the, the, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood up on their feet. And great fear fell upon them, which saw them. Mm, that's going to be a special event, isn't it? Either, you know, these guys are dead, laying in the streets, the world's celebrating, yay, the prophets are gone, and then the spirit of God enters them, and they stand up, and the world sees this. Verse 12, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Don't gloss over the insanity of this, okay? This is this is this is an, this is a crazy event. These two people are resurrected right there in the streets, in front of the whole world, and then they ascend up to heaven in a cloud. The world hears the great voice from heaven, "Come up hither." Verse thirteen. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. And the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe was past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. That's This is a special event that we see here taking place. These two witnesses preaching in the face of great adversity. That's what I like about Matthew Henry's commentary. He says their habit, their posture, they prophesied in sackcloth, right? They prophesy during the worst of times. When Christianity is at an all-time high of being hated, which, by the way, we're rapidly moving towards. Interesting event. So let's not get caught up in arguing over who they are. I know that I know that everyone. I know that many of you have strong opinions about this, but do not make it. Do not create out of it a pet doctrine. And you've heard me talk about pet doctrines. That's that thing that you believe that you have to protect with all your heart. And you view everything about the Bible through that pet doctrine. Don't make it your little pet. You can believe that it's Enoch and Elijah or Moses and Elijah. And that's, that's I am open to that possibility. But be open to that. It could be other things because you don't want to, you don't want to be confused. Have a, have a heart of humility when you're looking at prophecy because prophecy is not so you know the future. It's so that when it comes to pass, you can say, ah, there it is. I serve a God who dares to predict the future. But it's not so you can make your little charts and have it all figured out. If that were the case, I mean, think about all the little charts that's been made over the years that's failed miserably by people with great hearts and a great love for God and who are very wise and very well versed in the scriptures. And yet they were married to these ideas and then the, their faith and everything that they've worked hard for just comes crashing down before them because they just were unwilling to consider 
possibility that they didn't have it all figured out. Anyway, I digress. I pray that the day's study has been uh, a blessing to you. I pray that it's pierced your hearts in some way, that it's causing you to draw all the more near to God. You need to cling to the Savior. You need to hide under the wings of the Lord. You need to, he's a strong tower, the scriptures say, and the righteous run into him and they are saved. Put your faith in him and let go of this dying world. Don't forget the website, www.scriptureandprophecy.com. Please consider supporting this work if you're being blessed by it on a weekly basis. Thank you for listening. Peace and grace be with all of you, and until next time, God bless.